Did you ever meet someone who really impressed you? Someone you thought to yourself, or maybe even said to yourself, when I grow up, I'm gonna be just like her. What was she like that drew her to you? What impressed you about her? Was it your mom, maybe with her love and kindness and strength? Or maybe it was a teacher that poured into your life at a really difficult time. Or maybe it was a famous woman who did something extraordinary, like write a book or figure out some scientific puzzle or invent something that was amazing. Someone whose life impacted other people and the people around her and that we're still talking about today. I remember reading the story of Anne Frank when I was a young girl. She hid away in the attic uh, during the Nazi occupation and her diary has become famous. It was translated into almost 70 languages and is an intimate portrayal of one of the most inhumane moments in history and is able to educate us in the quality of emotion and passion and love, hope and desire and fear and strength. Or maybe it was someone like Maya Angelou. Maya is one of those influential women in American history and was a poet and singer, a memoirist, a civil rights activist whose award-winning memoir, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, made literary history as the first non-fiction bestseller by an African-American woman. It has been one of the loudest voices in the civil rights movement. Or maybe if you're like me, you like the monarchy and it's Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth I, an amazingly strong woman, powerful. She ruled the world and in many respects um, was the most powerful woman in the world at that time. Elizabeth called herself the Virgin Queen because she chose to marry her country rather than a man. It might be seem like ancient history now, but Queen Elizabeth I is one of the most successful monarchs in British history. And under her, England became a major European power in politics, commerce, and the arts. Then there was Marie Curie, who in 1906 said, nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we fear less. She was a Polish born Mary Marie Carey, was a pioneering physicist and scientist who coined the term radioactivity. She discovered two new elements, radium and polonium, and developed a portable x-ray machine. She was a brilliant woman. Curry won two separate Nobel Prizes, one for physics and one for chemistry. And to this day, she's the only person, regardless of gender, to receive two prizes for two different sciences. And I must mention Amelia Earhart. Earhart was one uh, uh, the American aviator who became the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic and the first person ever to fly solo from Hawaii to the USA. Amelia was a pioneering aviator and a true female trailblazer. In July 1937, she disappeared somewhere over the Pacific and was declared dead in absentia in 1939. Her plane wreckage has never been found and to this day, her disappearance remains one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of the 20th century. All these women and more were notable in their time and now for centuries. But as a believer in Christ, is there some woman that I should look to? Someone I should try to become like, to follow and to imitate? I'm sure, pretty sure, by now your mind has gone to that passage in Proverbs 31 about the virtuous woman. Many of us have read it or heard about her. And if you're like me, you shake your head and wonder how could one person possibly accomplish all that she does? And I thought, I've thought to myself, if this woman was real, she makes me feel overwhelmed and unable to keep up with her. I want to take a few sessions to look at this gal before we move on to looking at other great women of God in the scriptures and discover just how she ticks. What is God trying to tell us through this passage? Well, I look at, I read the passage and I thought, oh dear, where do I find a merchant ship bringing food from afar? Does that include Superstore? Should I now go into real estate and be buying and selling land? Or I should learn to spin cloth and make all my family's clothes of fine linen and purple. 
Then I should provide them with the best food for them. And if you knew the extent of my gardening skills, you would know my family would probably starve if they were depending on that. And in my spare time, what spare time? Now, and I'm not sure I've had much of that in a long time, but in my spare time, I would volunteer to the to a homeless shelter. There's, my, there's a part in there about even not being afraid of the snow. Does that mean I need to get myself a snow shovel or a snow blower? Will that be my job too? My goodness. Just what should my response in 2021 be to this ancient biblical manuscript? Well, before we go any further, we should look at who wrote this, why they wrote it, and the unique, interesting format in which it was written. A little digging into the background of something or of a passage usually helps us understand it better. Verse 1 of Proverbs 31 tells us that it was the queen mother's advice given to King Lemuel about women. Now, we're not actually sure who King Lemuel was. Was he a real character or or a contrived to teach this lesson. Some feel that it was another name for Solomon, in which case Lemuel's mother would have been Bathsheba. If that's the case, we have a fair amount of info on her. Let's take a brief moment and review who Bathsheba was. Well, she was a religiously conscientious married woman who was probably ritually bathing on the roof of her home after having her menstrual period, 2 Samuel 11. Secretly, she was viewed by the king, who should have been off to war, in 2 Samuel 11, after which she was brought to him for an illicit fair, affair while her husband was actually away fighting for the king. Oh, they don't make stories like this anymore. She was not complicit in this, but she was preyed upon by this man of position of supreme authority in the land. When she was discovered she was pregnant with David's child, he tried to cover it up but it was not successful. David then had her husband killed, and the scripture says she mourned his death. 2 Samuel 11 verse 26 says that she grieved. Then she was married to David, not for love, but to cover up the sin of the king. There may not have been much love involved, at least at the beginning of this relationship. It began out of lust. It was a marriage set up to cover the king's immorality. The prophet Nathan in 2 Samuel 12 rebukes David and gives him the grim news that this baby is going to die. And David pleads with him, but the baby died anyway. Remember, this was a judgment on David, but Bathsheba had to endure the pain of a loss of a child as well. The next child born to her was Solomon. Bathsheba raised a king. She must have been a strong woman. She seemed to um, make the most of this sad, awkward situation. But that doesn't mean it was easy. Bathsheba was surrounded by men who fell under the spell of women. David had a weakness for women. After all, he committed adultery with her. But the lure toward women didn't stop there. It continued into the next generation, as so often it does, with Bathsheba's son. In her lifetime, she became an advocate for Solomon, Solomon's rightful place as the next king. Bathsheba pressed David to keep his promise. In 1 Kings 1, she seemed to have an influence over the king, and he complied with her petitions. Now, a side note here is interesting. She na is named in the lineage of Jesus. Hope springs from the story of Bathsheba. Sometimes folks consider Christians clean and and squeaky. But if we view the lineage of Jesus, we see imperfect people claiming their spots in this miraculous ancestry of hope. If this queen mother was Solomon's mother, Bathsheba, we see a strong woman who faced some real challenges in her own life, who was born into the normal lifestyle as well, and who would be familiar with many of the things that this queen mother tells him. Maybe that was where she learned some of these timeless truths that she shares with her son, who sadly was in fact more like his father than not, and who, despite his gift of wisdom from God, ended up living quite an immoral lifestyle himself, which became his ultimate downfall. Some think that it could have been King Hezekiah. Others feel it was just some fictional king used to be the character in this poem and the advice from his wise mother 
Whoever it was, it was sage advice from a mother to her son. As it says in Proverbs 1 verse 8, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. I don't know about you, but being the mother of four boys led me at times to try and give instructions to them on how to treat a girl and, and about girls and how to choose good ones and that kind of thing. We women are often the template of the kind of woman, wife and mother, our daughters will likely imitate. And the kind of woman, wife and mother, our sons will often choose to be their partners. Whether they do it, we do it intentionally or not, it happens. We who are the, they are comfortable with, who they're drawn to, now, some have terrible experiences in their home and will intentionally seek out someone entirely different. But that, too, comes from our demonstration of what a woman, a wife, and a mother is, for better or worse. I am pleased with the choices my sons have made for their wives and find it interesting and somewhat humorous to see how alike their wives are in some areas to me. They certainly are their own woman. And that's good. But I see some striking similarities in us. We often do not recognize the power or influence we have as mothers over our sons and daughters. For better or worse, we influence our young sons in the choice of their mates. Maybe this was what this mother was trying to do too. We will just quickly skim through the opening nine verses to get a sense of this letter. She begins by telling him to keep his head. Don't let power go to your head. Don't be enticed by your position as king. Then she says in Proverbs 31, 3, don't allow women to, allow, to lure you into doing something you know better than to do. She warns Lemuel not to fall into the trap of immorality. Chasing after women will sap the king's strength. In verses 4 to 7, her advice is stay clear of mind-altering drink, and we could add that in the 2021 drugs, and keep a clear mind. She warns her son against the dangers of alcohol. A drunken king is never a good king. A ruler who craves beer and wine will pervert justice and act lawlessly. Remember why God placed you in the position of authority, she says, not to enrich your coffers, but to help those who are poor and needy in your kingdom and save your country. She concludes this opening part with defend the rights of the afflicted the needy. King Lemuel's mother instructs her son about the necessity of true justice. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of those who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. That's great motherly advice. May we always be aware of how we are impacting the choices and actions of the next generation by how we act and react to, to circumstances and the challenges that we face. Our country is crying out for leaders, men and women who have the moral and spiritual fortitude to govern in a godly way. And frankly, there's not many around. It's a sad testament to the lack of good influence we as parents and as particularly mothers have had on the next generation. It's not all our fault, but we must assume some of it. Lemuel took his mother's advice and wrote us a poem in the form of an acrostic in Hebrew about the kind of woman she described. GotQuestions.org says, as Lemuel was growing up, his mother gave him sage advice, which he later arranged in poetic form and recorded for the ages. The whole process was supervised by the Holy Spirit and the result was an inspired utterance and as, as inspired as any other portion of the scriptures. You could look at 2 Peter 1 verse 21 about the inspiration of scripture. Our interesting point to make here is that the poem was not written to a woman. It was actually directed to men, believe it or not. James Lindbergh of The Working Preacher shares about a retired rabbi in his town who gave him the insight into Proverbs 31, 10 to 31. This is what he said. He was a congenial presence around the town and also at the college where I taught. In this case, he was visiting my freshman religion class and we were talking about the Jewish wedding and wedded customs. He gave me insight into Proverbs 31 that I've appreciated ever since. Each Sabbath evening, he told us, I recite the poem 
in Proverbs 31 to my wife. It begins a good wife who can find and ends with the husband addressing his wife directly in a you statement. Many women have done exceeding ex excellently, but you surpass them all. This means that once a week after reciting an alphabet of statements about what a good wife was, the Jewish husband was to look her in the eyes and then switch to a you statement saying in effect, there are lots of great women out there, but baby, you're the best of them all. If you've ever read the book of Proverbs, you may notice that the subject of these last 22 lines of the book describing a woman of noble character actually are giving life to the lady wisdom spoken of in chapters one to nine in Proverbs. This woman is termed the virtuous woman. The author here in chapter 31 is showing us what wisdom looks like in action. Theology of Work Project tells us translators variously use words virtuous, capable, excellent, or of noble character in different Bible versions to describe this woman's character in Proverbs 31.10. But these terms fail to capture the element of strength or might present in the underlying Hebrew word chayil. When applied to a man, this term is translated as strength, as in Proverbs 31.3. Do not give your strength to a woman. This wording is battlefield terminology. It appears 246 times in the, New, the Old Testament and applies to fighting men like David's mighty warriors. In 1 Chronicles 7 verse 2, the sons, it says, The sons of Tola were mighty men of valor in their generation. The Hebrew here is gibor chayil. Men of valor. The female equivalent is Eshet Chayil, women of valor. This, ladies, is telling us that we are to be a warrior princess, a strong woman whose life is built on principle and godliness. I was a tomboy when I was growing up, and even when, now when I think about being a warrior princess, ooh, that'd be someone I want, would say, when I grew up, I want to be like her. Rachel Held Evans tells a story about a Jewish friend of hers named Ahava who shared her with her about this very special phrase. She said, Ahava explained to me that she and her friends cheer one another on with the blessing, celebrating everything from promotions to pregnancies to acts of mercy and justice to battles with cancer with a hearty eshet chayil, thinking of it as something like, you go girl. According to Ahava, valor isn't about what you do, it's how you do it. Hmm. If you're a stay-at-home mom, be a stay-at-home mom of valor. If you're a nurse, be a nurse of valor. If you're a CEO or a barista at Starbucks, if you are rich or poor, single or married, do it all with valor. That's what makes you a Proverbs 31 woman, not creating a life worthy of a Pinterest board. Hmm. Proverbs 31.17 tells us she girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. This captures both the strength and the virtue carried by the Hebrew word chayil. The, the, the practical activities of Proverbs 31 woman look a lot different than the woman of today, but I know there are principles here that we can and should apply to our lives. God's word is timeless and unchanging, so I'm sure there are values and ideologies in this passage that we should apply to ourselves. Modern Biblical Women of the 21st Century. So let me read it with you. An excellent wife who can find, for her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good, not evil, all her, of her days. She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She is like merchant ships, she brings food from her far. She rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. Her earnings, she With her earnings, she bought plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches out her hand to the distaff and her hands grasp the spindle. She extends her hands to the poor and she stretches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for her household are clothed with scarlet. She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. 
Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. She opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and bless her, and her husband also, and he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands, and let her work, works praise her in the gates. Wow. I think I do a lot of things. This woman does this and this, all of this and keeps it together. So her husband trusts her. He praises her and her children bless her. It is, I admit, a little overwhelming and I'm tempted to just close the book and give up even before I begin. But let's push through this together. Let's see what God is trying to tell us through this passage. I have, as usual, when preparing one of our sessions, done a lot of reading on the subject what the passage says, and what others have said about the passage. Lisa Apello says, So how does a modern woman exemplify this antiquated picture of virtue and learn about becoming a Proverbs 31 woman? By looking at the virtues of her heart instead of the actions of her hands. After all, it's about who you are, not what you do. Isn't that what being a Christian is about, after all? The virtues of the heart totally committed to the Savior? When you really listen to what Jesus was preaching, you will see that his entire message was on fulfilling the law through grace, rather than shackling people with a load of rules and expectations and having them always fall short. Ephesians 2, 8 tells us, For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And ladies, it's also the gift of God is the grace that we live. God enables us through grace to obey his word and do what we ought to do, thus becoming more and more like Jesus. It's about surrender and willingness to allow Christ to reign in our lives. Jesus taught that truth, that it was all about our old self dying and our new self being reborn in the likeness of Christ. It begins and ends with the attitude of one's heart, we are called to be more Christ-like than the world around us. Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Then Christ begins a work in us to make us like him. Philippians 1, 6. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. The work of or lifestyle God calls us to follow and obey is one that he empowers us to accomplish. This does not mean that our own willingness is not vital, but when the heart is willing, then God empowers us to accomplish what he's called us to do. If God calls you or brings you to it, God will bring you through it. It begins by saying yes, Lord, to God with your whole heart and your whole mind. The verse we like to quote often in Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Well, apparently, that doesn't just mean be quiet. It actually means let go. That's very different. Let go of trying to control everything around you. Let go of worry and fretfulness. Let go of trying to control your spouse. Let go of bitterness and unforgiveness. Let go of your past and what you cannot control. Let go of the fears our society seems to want to sow deep in your heart. Let go of worrying what other people may think of you. Let go, and as my Nana used to say, um, uh, let go of trying to keep all your ducks in a row. Let go and let God. Then it says rest. Rest in what? Rest in the knowledge that God is in control. He has never lost control and he never will. In Daniel 3, 16 to 18, the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, said to the king, We do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. 
from the furnace of burning fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your God or worship the golden image you have set up. I heard it said once that the reason these three men could enter that fiery furnace with this kind of confidence was that they knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that day who had his hand on the thermostat. God not only protected them from the fire and even the smell of fire, but he sent his son Jesus to be with them in the middle of it. Wow. Letting go begins when I accept Christ as my Savior and Lord. I used to wonder why we often put those two phrases together, Savior and Lord. But I've come to understand the vital connection of the two. You cannot have one without the other. In order for me to actually come to him in repentance for salvation, I have to recognize my sinful heart as well as give him lordship of my life. And what does it mean to let go and let Christ be Lord of my life? It means letting him reign supreme over my personal will and desires, bowing my knee to his position as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Melech HaMelechim. As we studied in our last session on the names and attributes of God, Jesus being called Lord of Lords means there is no one greater, there is no higher authority. His reign is supreme and absolute. So And so must be supreme in my life too. In order for me to be totally, truly saved and live in the strong, as a strong warrior princess described in Proverbs 31, I must make him savior and my Lord, and I must bow to him. Philippians 2, 9 and 10. For this reason also God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, King of kings and Lord of lords, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Romans thirteen fourteen. But, you, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lust. Romans 14, 9. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. I know from my own experience as a believer in Christ that there are times in my life when I take back control, or I try to, from God, and God in his mercy draws me back to him in full surrender to his will and his ways. I am, or should be, in process, becoming more and more like him. That's what Lordship is about. My friends, we are believers in process, just pilgrims at different points on that journey towards Christ's likeness. I'm excited to have this opportunity to dig into God's word with you, my sisters. I, I pray that we will allow God to continue to mold us and make us in his image. Well, that's just an intro to this famous passage, Proverbs 31. I'm looking forward to meeting with you next time when we'll begin to look at the meat and potatoes of the teaching on being a valiant woman, the warrior princess God wants us to be. See you then.